Welcome back to Partnerships for Smarter Security. My name is Dave Vellante, and I'm your host for this multi-part series where we explore the dynamics of cybersecurity generally, and specifically how partnerships across the ecosystem can improve the defense posture in response to successful cyber attacks. I'm here with Steve Keniston. Steve is a senior cybersecurity consultant. He's got a focus on cross-portfolio, across Dell's portfolio and the partner portfolio, and Adam Miller, who's the marketing lead, security and managed, managed services, both individuals with Dell Technologies, who is making this program possible. Jets, welcome to theCUBE. Good Hi, Steve. Steve. Thank you. Let's get into it. Um, we've talked a lot in this series, Steve, about your methodology, which is three-pronged, three, three pronged, as the audience may remember. Reduce the attack service, you got to detect and respond, and then you have to recover from that attack. Where did that framework come from how do customers respond to it, Adam? I'd be really interested in that. And, and how's it going? Yeah, I, I think what's really great about that, Dave, is uh, in a lot of, I can maybe start with, you know, in, in marketing, right? We had, they had, before we came up with this kind of methodology, there were what we used to call three pillars. And it was protection, resilience, and confidence. And I started asking a lot of customer, a lot of our sellers, how many customers are actually coming to you to, to buy confidence? And they kind of chuckled, not many. And so what we wanted to do was kind of turn it around and really talk about what customers were asking our sellers more about how to solve these problems. And they were really around attack surface reduction, being able to find these threats when they get through, that's the detection response. And then the recovery component, once it happens, now we're going to get my business back to operational. It's really transformed, I think, the way our customers and our sellers communicate with each other in a more positive way so that folks actually know what they're thinking about and know what to ask us about and know what to talk about. And uh, Adam and I do a lot of executive briefings together, and my re reaction from the, our customers has been super positive. And I get a lot of head shaking. Yes, that's what we're trying to focus on. I'm a well, yeah, let's get, let's get into that a little bit because you guys just, uh, you were telling me about your new EBC in, in Hopkinton. I haven't got the invite yet, but I'd love to come down and check it out. And so when you meet with CISOs or C-level executives, or specifically CTOs, what, how, does, how does this framework resonate? And, you know, getting beyond the sort of superficial, what, what's the real sort of double click on that, Adam? If you would, absolutely. conversation like. Yeah, look, I mean, reiterating what Steve said, customers absolutely love the framework. And I think why is because we started putting things in the terms that they need. So they're interested in reducing their attack surface and trying to stop as much as they can before it gets in. They're interested in doing better detections and being able to see what comes in and then responding when it does. If they have to recover, of course, they need a plan in place. So when they hear us come to them with this type of message, it's very credible. It's exactly the things that they're looking for. You know, um, there's stat out there that if you look at the cybersecurity market, it's Let's say it's 80 billion, you know, maybe it's a hundred billion, maybe it's 50 billion. It's big, many, many, many tens of billions. And if you look at the market shares, I think the leading market share is like a single digit market share. Um, and that's why, at least one reason why you have this, this, so this propagation of so many tools, there's just so many companies out there. So my point is no one company can do it alone. Partnerships are critical. That's obviously the theme of this, this series. Why are they important? And, and do you have a, a framework? You've got this framework, the three pillars that you guys just talked about. Do you have a similar framework in terms of how you think about partnerships for cybersecurity success? Yeah, I think you positioned that and framed it up very well, Dave. So first of all, from a simplicity standpoint, which is really important because there are thousands of different tools out there that people can buy, right? When we look at our framework, the attack surface reduction, detection response, and recovery, what I try to educate our customers on is don't look at those as trying to buy products from a single thing to solve a particular leg of the stool. Look at, look at our framework as a whole, as a way to look at how do I solve my security problem more simply. So think about this. Our data protection products do multi-factor authentication. They do uh, roles-based access. They do um, uh, multi-login capabilities. That's a way to reduce the attack surface of your backup. We do MDR capabilities. We do CyberSense in our um, recoveries. 
that's a way to detect what's going on in the backup. And then obviously we have the vault and the isolation and that sort of thing. That's a great way to do recovery. Now I'm not looking at multiple tools for one thing for data protection. I'm looking at a single solution that can do that can solve all that all those challenges, right? So one tool to be able to solve all those challenges. And when we do that, we really think about at the product level, how can we incorporate someone or some partner or some vendor that can help us add to what we do so that when you purchase a single solution for something you're trying to accomplish, maybe a new workload or something like that, you can you can get those capabilities without adding multiple layers of different security solutions on top of that. You know, another topic that comes up a lot, and we've talked about it a little bit in this series, I'd like to just hit on it a little bit, uh, if we could, Adam, is supply chain security. Steve, you and I have talked about it a lot. I mean, you got pagers blowing up. How does that happen without some kind of infiltration into the supply chain? So um, how, whatever you think about, you know, that whole hot war, that that incident underscores that somebody got through. I mean, you go all the way back to Stuxnet, where Natanz was air-gapped, and yet somebody, presumably the United States and Israel, got in to affect the the speed of, of the, 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 the mechanism, and they very slowly sped it up, but it was air-gapped, but they got through the air-gap. So these are supply chain issues. How do you think about that, and where do partnerships fit in? I mean, in the one hand, it Partnerships create seams, and but you have, so you have to address that. What's Dell's role in that? Great question. So for us, supply chain kind of means we'll go into two things. First of all, it's on the hardware side, how we acquire all the different pieces that make up all of our our products and our our, our data center uh, equipment and our devices. That's one side. Of course, understanding where it all came from, knowing that we can attest that to customers so that they can see exactly what we've done and how we've done it. The next is on the software side. And this becomes really important when we're onboarding software partners like we've been talking about here. What that means is that we go deeply into the engagements with our partners. This is not simply you know reselling a software that our customers already have on a different SOW, but this is working very closely with them at the technology level, at the engineering level to start building the things that we need. Just to pull out an example, what that might mean is um, something that we hear from customers all the time is, hey, I've got 70 different security tools and I'm having trouble managing them. If we think a little bit more about that though, one of the things within that is secrets management and simply just managing the passwords to log into all of those different tools. When we approach our partners, one of the things that we're asking them to come to the table with us on is not just how to resell and how to partner to deliver what our customers need in maybe a little bit more seamless of a fashion, but where we get into is how can we come on to the same authentication standards so that when you buy a service from Dell, you get a federated identity that then hits every single other product or service that you're buying from Dell. So just to kind of connect that uh, to some of the um, capabilities specifically, if you're thinking about MDR with Dell, all of a sudden we also have a, a, a way of packaging that up with other things across reducing the attack surface, things like penetration testing or breach attack simulations. Each one of those produce reports that our customers need to see, even though it's a managed service. So what we do is give them one single login. They can log in. Go find every single report that we've done. They can better engage with our analysts. They can better engage with all the documentation that they need to see what we've done and to see the ways that we're working together. You know, one of the things that I think about when I think about partnerships is partnerships with customers, okay? So customers, a significant portion of the customer's expertise is focused on, you know, protecting their organization. Their best talent is geared toward doing that. It's not geared toward necessarily seeing around corners, like what's next. So they have to rely on the technology community, a vendor like Dell or and or its partners to see what's what's coming next. So you think about, okay, endpoint, that's a very clear threat or laptops or devices, you know, mobile creative new um, exposure for us. Cloud was like, came the first line of defense, but it also created exposures and seams, APIs. We've talked about the API economy. Well, the API also has APIs have holes in them, you know, and security flaws. Um, Gen AI, all of a sudden, people can use Gen AI to do better phishing. Um, you know, LLMs and SLMs and now agents of small action models and large action models and all these agents. That's going to be same. What else is out there that we should be worried about, Steve? That That's great, Dave. I'm glad you brought that up because I think the way, even the way we started this out by talking about marketing and how we've transformed a little bit, 
I tend to think a lot of vendors, whether no matter what space you're in or what, what you're trying to cover, you tend to be about six to 12 months ahead of the customer. And, and that, that's by design, right? As the product teams are working on products, you're trying to think about what's the next thing? How do you see around that corner? And Adam and I have done a number of executive briefings with customers where the topic of post-quantum cryptography mm. has come up. Interesting. And I'd be really uh, interested to hear, what do you hear as an analyst or in the analyst community, what's coming up around that? Because you know, it's, it's coming up a lot more recently. Well, so I'll, first of all, I'm no expert on, on quantum. Uh, um, and it's not something that I really paid attention to a lot until last November. I mean, pay attention a little bit. And Floyer and I talk about it all the time. Um, I was at, and I know they're a competitor. They're also a partner. I was at IBM at the Thomas J. Watson Research Center. IBM is a, is a national, their research facility is a national treasure. I mean, we've, the United States has lost Bell Labs. I don't know, where's Xerox Park, Xerox Park these days, right? So IBM as a research entity is, is very important, I think, to our country. So anyway, uh, we were there for a series of briefings, and one of them was on quantum. And then we got the tour of the quantum facility. A lot of it was under NDA, um, which was fine. I'm safe because I don't, you know, I'm no expert in that space. But there were probably about 100 analysts there, and I would say four or five really deep into quantum. And I was listening to them. And one of the things I learned was there are at least four to five, maybe six or seven prevailing approaches to quantum. And they all have their strengths and, and they all have their sort of drawbacks. Uh, but it's becoming increasingly apparent that the probability of one or some of these uh, being commercialized by the end of the decade is, is, very, is much higher than I thought it was. So I think by the end of the decade, we are going to see um, a viable uh, quantum architecture emerge. And I've always been concerned about, well, you got to rewrite the applications, but I think a hybrid will, will, will come forth. I'd love your thoughts on this, where existing applications can run on von Neumann architectures and the, some newer applications will be able to run on the quantum piece of the architecture and of course, that brings new cyber threats. And I'm curious from your perspective, from Dell's perspective, what that looks like. Maybe we can chat on what kind of applications might emerge. Yeah, I think the application thing is really interesting. My dad has been in IT for his whole life, and he always says, says son, you know, every time you change platforms, you're going to rewrite the applications. And I started thinking about what, what are some of the new applications, which I'm sure are going to be AI-generated applications or AI applications in general. But in addition, I, like you, not an expert, but having done a bunch of uh, research in this space as of recent, right, a lot of the, the capabilities that NIST is putting out as far as the new algorithms that need to be put in place for hardware signing or firmware signing or software signing, right, just need to be start, you need to start putting some of these algorithms in place by 2025 for release in 2030. So there's a lot of things that are going on in this particular space. And that's what brought up my interest in this and, and, and our curiosity in this and trying to, again, stay ahead of the customer so we can ensure they're safe and secure as well. And for the most part, it, so far what I've understood is the encryption capabilities are going to be broken more easily by quantum solutions than we have today. And right now, that's that's the big focus. To, when you do these EBCs, I mean, are customers thinking about quantum? What kinds of questions are you getting? Yeah, they, they absolutely are. Um, you know, we've seen everything from some of the larger banks out there already hiring quantum teams. We've seen even, you know, I spoke to a CTO last week who runs a service provider and was very interested in where quantum is going. Um, not just simply because it's a technology that we, we want to align to, of course, you need to, like you said, refactor, or rebuild applications and things to, to work in that new paradigm. But they're also interested in things like, well, what is quantum's um, impact on say an encrypted database? And let's take that one step further say, an encrypted database that has already been stolen and exfiltrated. So can the attackers then go back and find old data, decrypt it, and now use that for a whole new wave of identity-based attacks on individuals? That's one of the things that I've been asked about a few times now is, well, Dell, how do you see this? And I think the message from Dell is that one of the things that we are trying very hard to do is be out in the market with the capabilities before the need is actually there. Of course, that's what everybody's trying to do. But as we're bringing these uh, through step by step, I think as we saw in other various technology transitions in you know the past decade, whether it's you know cloud or uh, anything like that, 
what we see is a, a little bit of a hybrid approach up front. And then as we progress more uh, into the future, you see more and more uh, dedicated solutions being built out. So just like with Gen AI, you know, attackers are going to have access to this, to quantum, because cloud guys are going to have like, quantum services. Any other thoughts you have on this topic? Yeah. I mean, first of all, there's an affordability component to this, but there were, everybody thought that was going to be the same thing with AI. But to, to keep going with what Adam said, that is the big fear. Right. The big fear is that the threat actors today who don't have quantum, and I think the term is harvest, they're harvesting a lot of data and they're saving it because they can't break the, the encryption algorithms. But as soon as they can with the quantum capabilities, right, they're going to break those algorithms. And then who knows what that encrypted database held and, and what it could do to you a year, two, three years down the road. I mean, it's all, it's all pretty critical. I mean, how often do you change your password every three years? <laughs> well, we're trying to force people to change the passwords like every six months. It's some of our SaaS vendors, Salesforce, you know, people complain about it every time you got to change your password. Um, but they make you. They make can't you. get into Salesforce without changing your password. So we're trying to implement, you know, similar I mean, things, basic things like you were talking about, MFA, you know, that's pretty fundamental. You certainly have it on your bank app, your banking app. You better have it, you know, pretty much in all your, your, your sensitive apps like email. Um, and I don't know, by the way, so listen to Jensen, because Jensen has visibility on what's coming. And the reason I bring this up is I don't know if you guys have played around with GPT-10. You know, um, it reasons. Jensen at, at GTC in a private analyst thing was talking about in the future, AI is going to be able to reason. You're going to give AI you know, a, a query or a question or a problem and say, go off and solve it. Take a week and I have $2,000 to spend. Go spend it. And so- we're seeing a glimpse of that today with with one O, where it, it it will reason for thirty or forty seconds. It will even sometimes I saw this this weekend. It'll give you two answers, one that reasoned for ten seconds and another one that reasons for thirty seconds, and, and it'll ask you which one's better. It's probably hoping that the ten second is better because it's cheaper. The point is, when you start getting, I, I think you're right, Steve, that AI is going to be one of those new applications. You're going to have to rewrite. An application necessarily. You don't know, rewrite your general ledger to run on quantum, but you are going to write new applications that are you know, machine intelligent, you know, driven, and quantum potentially can do that. And reasoning might be one way to take maybe a, a week long, you know, reasoning uh, schedule down to I don't know seconds. I don't know. I don't know enough about quantum to know. But I'll give you guys the final thoughts on um, on this whole topic on this whole series that we've run together. Thank you, first of all, for your support and helping us educate the community. But final thoughts from both Steve and, and then Adam, bring us home. I really think that uh, I, I love where we've kind of transformed our message to the attack surface reduction, the ability to detect and respond to threats that we know are going to come through. We always say it's if, not when. I mean, it's when, not if. And then the ability to recover. So if we can continue to model that model around our capabilities, our, our solutions, and ensure that our customers are fulfilling each one of their needs in each one of those buckets, hopefully by consolidating solutions and making sure our solutions do all those things. And again, staying ahead of the customer so we're, we're, we're ahead of what they're going to need, I think we're going to be doing a really good job. Yeah, in, in, in total agreement there, Steve. I think one of the other things that um, I really liked about this this new message that we've got here is that um, it's exactly what customers are looking for and allows us to not just kind of talk about a, a Dell on Dell conversation, but talk to them about their needs and security, talking about all the partnerships, talking about all the different security that, frankly, uh, software that they are already deploying today, ways that we can help them, uh, you know, reduce their burdens uh, operationally is, is is really exciting and just love the way we've taken that. And we all know that that the, the customers out there, they're stressed, they're overworked, uh, there's a lack of of talent in order to solve this problem and this a bit, is a bit I like to think of it in a very two simple very, very two very simple dimensions one is the probability uh, of an incident which Steve as you said is very high it's not a matter of if it's it's when so assume it's 100% um and the frequency of that is 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 shortening it used to be once every 10 years now it's you know once a week or whatever it is but the other dimension is the impact and that's what you can control. You can't control the adversary's moves, but you can control your security posture and the impact of that breach. And if if the impact of that breach is minimized, 
that means the ROI of the attacker is a lesson. And that means they'll go elsewhere. So, so guys, thanks for, again, helping us educate the audience. Uh, and thank you for watching this episode in our series where we've explored Dell's framework, its partnerships in cybersecurity. It's bromide, but it's true. It's a team sport. Go to Dell.com. There's tons of information there. Obviously, SiliconAngle.com for all the news. Cube.net is where you'll see programs like this. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Dave Vellante, and we'll see you next time.